Okay, let me talk a little bit about how I got here. Um, as uh, you all know that I joined CET in 68 and graduated in 72. And right after that, I was a lecturer in the college for about five months. I quit that job, became a technical officer in a bank because that was a much higher paying job than the lecturer job. After three months, I got tired of that one, quit that, took a lower paying job in Caltron. I was among the first few employees of Caltron. That's a research company started by, I think, Erla Gorman. And I was the, among the maybe the top first six employees of that institution. And from day one, I was trying to get to some higher education, get some higher education in US or England or somewhere else, and been working quite a bit. Um, I wrote to the, the way I got to Stanford is I wrote to the US embassy. In those days, there was no email, no phone calls, so it's all post, postal information. And they gave me a list of 168 institutions in the US. I applied to all of them. It took me a lot of time, effort, and spent a lot of money in the post office. And finally, I got to Stanford, finished my MS. And then for a few months, I worked in an institution called NRAO. Uh, I think yes, that's a National Radio Astronomy Observatory which listens to communications, radio communications and radio output from the stars in the galaxies far and near. And that also I got bored, uh, joined GE from there. I spent 43 years with GE. And in between I got a, some education in Gannon University and I taught at the Gannon University. That's my brief history. So let me talk about what I worked on on the Top right, you see a train. Uh, so G transportation makes the locomotives, not the train, just the locomotives. Those are much bigger than the ones you see in India. It's a 200 ton train, a locomotive. Uh, then we also make uh, trucks, which are shown at the bottom right. Uh, those are bigger than a typical house, maybe a two story, three story house. Uh, million ton operation. So I combined the education from CET I got in power and control uh, and used the control and computer information I got from Stanford and used the power conversion methods and techniques for metros, locomotives, off highway vehicles and to control the whole train. And my objective has always been performance, performance, and fuel efficiency. Oops. So one of the things we want to talk about is R&D, but I spend most of my time in development and very little part in the research portion of it. So that's why I highlighted the D part and not the R part, the only way I'm going to show a couple of examples, two of them to be exact. And one of them is a very simple problem I solved. Uh, this problem has been around since 1800, 200 year old problem. And in that respect, you look, the process you follow is you look at it and there is always problems around you. And most of those problems are opportunities for you to work, for, work to solve. And you can look around, you'll see lots of them. This is a 200 year old problem. When the trains go on track, if the track is slippery, it cannot pull. And during fall, during rainy season, during snowy season, it's always slippery and trains do stall. So this, will, and if you can improve that adhesion, that means you can put more cars in the train, more productivity. So the objective was to improve that pulling power of a locomotive when it's slippery. So sand is the most common used technique. So you put sand on the track and clear the debris. And the way I worked around is when you want to paint, when you want to clean surfaces, the thing you do is sandblast is what's done. So we worked around, spent a lot of time looking at various things. Sand was one of them, 
Walnut shell was another one. We use glass beads. We put high velocity glass beads into the rail to see if it can clean it. And we did some of those tests. So you turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, and look at the pulling power. And after some time, the technician told me that we ran out of sand, but we didn't notice the difference. So just compressed air alone was sufficient to clean the rail. And that's the moment I said, okay, it's a, that is the solution. Use high velocity compressed air to clean the track. And that was one of my solutions. It doesn't cost anything. In this, there is no material cost allowed other than the compressor and a high velocity system with a nozzle. It took us many, many years to perfect it, but still a very low cost solution. So the controls involved is when do you want to turn it on? When do you want to turn it off? How much pressure should you use? How, what angle should it be? What height? All kinds of things are needed to finally perfect it, but that was the luck that we got to that solution. Now, once you got to the solution, it brings more problems with it and more opportunities with it. So when you have a solution, you need a market and a customer. Without a market and a customer, if you cannot sell it, it has no value. So in our, in our case, it made about 18,000 kilograms of extra force, which means in a train, you can put 18 more cars. That's the productivity with very little cost added to it. The problems it brought around is when you supply compressed air at a high velocity, if anybody is standing nearby, the pebbles and stones will hit you. So it need solutions for that, we came up with it. And another one which happened is in Australia and other places, during some seasons, there'll be lots of millipedes on the track. If the millipedes are on the track, normally the trains will crush them. It's 30, 40 ton axles going by, 200 axles going on top of it, it crushes them and the rail becomes slippery. With this, we blast the millipedes out of the way, they live and the rail is no longer slippery. That's an opportunity which came along unexpectedly. So it's a simple problem. Sorry, complex problem, a simple solution. Next, I want to talk about another example. This is a complex problem and a complex solution. And this problem will be there for a long time to come. And therefore, lots of opportunities there too. Around maybe beginning of 2000, the batteries became more and more feasible, like so NICAD batteries, nickel metal hydride batteries, lithium ion batteries. They all started coming around, practical batteries started coming around 2000. So we built a locomotive. This is a battery attached to it, ran it up and down the track. So this was my project. And uh, we got funding from the Department of Energy to do this. Uh, and the problem with batteries is we need to know when to charge, when, when to discharge. So you need to know what is coming ahead of us so if it's an uphill coming, you want to dis, uh, you don't want to discharge the battery. If it's a long downhill coming, you want to dis, uh, discharge the battery so that you can recover the energy back from the train. So you need to know what is coming ahead of it. So we tried solving that problem. And in between, the battery cost was too high. So we, the, commercially, you couldn't sell battery-operated locomotives. So what I looked into it, what if you don't have batteries? What can I do with that same problem that you want to go from point A to B? Is there a better way to run the train from point A to B? And so if you look at the trains, trains have a lot of variation. So typical trains are 2,000 to 45,000 tons and all the way to 99,000 tons. It could be three to one to three kilometers up to seven kilometers long. It could be a, could use a very small power to power the train, like 0.3 kilowatt per ton. That is trying to run a car with a drill. That's the amount of power the train has. For the weight it has got, this is the amount of power it has got. So I came up with a something we call a trip optimizer. 
uh, which is a planned generation. So if you know how it works is that when the operator gets on board the train, he pushes a button. The information goes to our GE's WebTech server. The server knows which road number the, inf the operator pushed the button. It contacts the railroad server, so it knows where the train is going from to, what the, how many cars it has got, what the tonnage of each car, how long is the train, what is the route it's going to take, what is the civil and permanent and temporary speed limits, what the train handling constraints are, how much force it's allowed to have. And once you get that information all on board the train, it has a track map, it generates a plan. It's essentially an optimization problem, a very complex optimization problem to generate a speed and drive the train to that profile. It makes a huge amount of uh, fuel savings, as you can see, it makes of the order of, we, we saved about 1.1 billion gallons of diesel fuel with that product. So you can see the impact it's drawn and you can ignore the, the optimization problem that runs at various places in the, in the world. So essentially the same technique, it, it, this also happened to some extent by luck. We started with the battery, battery cost was too high, whatever the solution which was used for the battery we turned it around and used without the battery and got about a billion tons of uh, diesel fuel savings. So you, you cannot tell when you do a research or when you're development where it's going to end up at, look for a solution. When they come up with a solution, if the problem won't, find a problem which will solve that. Then, and I want to leave with this one. Uh, so the message I have is be persistent, expect lots of failures, accept the failures and move on and look for new problems or opportunities for the problems you have. And you need a huge amount of teamwork, that is key. It cannot be done by yourself in most of the problems. You need a huge amount of teamwork and support. So the future, this is a picture which uh, I don't think anybody else would have seen so far, the first World's first battery only powered locomotive. It's going to be out next month. So I'm standing inside where the diesel engine used to be. So this looks like a server room. These are all lithium ion batteries all around. It's a 2.4 megawatt hour battery, huge battery sitting there. And I expect within the next 10 years, you'll see a 10 megawatt hour locomotives. Uh, so it's going, demonstration starts next year in California. Uh, and it has, as I said, 10,000 plus sensors. The moment you put 10,000 sensors, 20,000 sensors, you can imagine the problem to make it work reliably. So which, so this, the problem is 10,000 sensors. How do you make it reliably? And that work I have subcontracted or given to Penn State University and a student from Kerala is doing the research on that. Another one we are looking at is to use drones. There are typically two, two to three people operating the train. That's a huge cost. One option is to inspect the track right in front of the train. So send a drone from the locomotive, inspect the track and come back to the locomotive. So it'll be the charging station will be the locomotive. It goes maybe a mile, maybe half a mile ahead of the train inspecting the tracks. So you don't need two people. That's one concept. So there is lots of technology needed because it need to go at 70 mile an hour. It need to go and avoid all the obstacles need to communicate to the operator. That's one. There is another one which we have built. It goes and inspects the train when it comes bleed, bleed there, connect there. It's a tedious work and it's the climate is not that good, snow and winter and rain, so this is a tedious operation. So it would be nice if the operator could sit either on the side or in the main station and don't have to go and look at every locomotive, connect them together. There is another, when you drive, you'll see signals. The operator has to watch for it. The operator has to watch for the obstacles. You need to analyze the track damage. So this also 
I'm working with an alumni from CET to solve that problem. So you, this is just few, few of the things which I see coming pretty soon. So anybody with any IT background can have a significant contribution to it. So the, so if you look around, you'll see lots of examples for research. You'll see lots of examples where innovation could be done. So in that respect, I'm extremely happy that my alma mater is inspiring to higher levels through events like this webinar. And I'm sure somebody of the caliber of Dr. Howard will be with this all his financial and business background should be able to give you a lot more perspective than I could. And with that, and with high pride and great pleasure, I declare this webinar open. Thank you.